warm-up band. Our author, Peter Fortunato, is going to greet you from Carnival. And uh, I just want to say a few words about my fabulous husband. You will discover what a fabulous he is inside the pages of his book. This is published by Fomite Press in Vermont. It was literally, he said to me, if these people don't take it, I'm going to self-publish. <laughs> they took it in five days. So they really loved the book. And it's a wonderful book. I myself have known it for years. Um, and we're having this book launch on a feast day. Today is the day of St. Nicholas. Yay! And um, St. Nicholas is the patron of sailors and thieves, <laughs> which is pirates, I guess. He's also the patron of students. And tonight we also have a wonderful student with us, Tashi Chutso, who's our goddaughter, and she has been doing the book sales. All right, Peter. <laughs> wonderful to be here at the Foundation of Life. I want to thank Melissa Hoffman for everything she's done uh, to facilitate not only this event, but everything she does for the Foundation of Life. The Foundation of Life is really a great uh, community resource. Here, here. <laughs> uh, here's what it says about the book. The painter Guido Diamante is plunged into the mystery surrounding the apparent suicide of his rascal mentor at the Hudson River College. Exciting heady times ensue as he reviews his own guilty past and traces his life through a labyrinth of adventures from the sexy, psychedelic 1960s to the financial crisis of 2008. Steeped in references to Renaissance art, alchemy, and the tarot, Carnival is a family saga, a satire of the art market and of faculty life, and the story of Guido's love for his wayward cousin Tina, a psychic like him. I wish I could read the whole book to you. <laughs> Snake eyes were hard, but you could win big with a pair of aces, except on your first throw, which didn't make sense to me. The name of the game is craps, but craps means you lose. My father tried teaching me to play, and I liked to throw sidearms, snapping my wrist and from my fist letting the dice fly. It was like Mata, he said, that hand game older than the Romans. You had to trust in lady luck and see in your mind the point you were shooting. Say it out loud. Quattro, cinque, sei. He said all kinds of things to make the dice do what he wanted. Sometimes they obeyed. The men played craps on the pool table at the villa, bar towels stuffed in the holes and small bills scattered on the felt. They cheered after making their points and jiggled the rocks in their empty glasses. They bought refills with moolah stuffed into my father's pockets afternoons before he or Gracie Laporta would open the bar. One of the guys, Georgie the Mick, a bricklayer, Brawny and blonde took a long time to shoot. Baby needs a new pair of shoes, he'd shout, even though he didn't have a kid. And Gracie, well, I doubted he'd ever bought her anything. My father, a real comedian, towels swinging from his belt like a scalp high on his own booze, would whoop the loudest when he was losing. Gotta work hard to for my old lady, he wisecrack. Did you know she's irrational? blowing into his fist, pumping the air before his throw, and this one, a wise crack he used to, to distract the mick. Don't get hitched, Georgie, my friend. Stay play boy. I was watching from a booth at the back of the cocktail lounge, my shadow box, I call that spot, waiting my turn, not to drink or to chance a buck on the bones, but to try my luck at love. I wasn't a kid anymore when Gracie Laporta started working for us. Georgie's girl, or so the Mick liked to say. So that continues. 
introducing uh, Guido. It's always interesting, right, when you have a first-person narrator. You know, and this is one of those things as a reader that I've always taken into account. The first-person narrator presumably is writing from some future time and looking back. And so the first-person narrator knows something about the story, how much he or she may know about themselves. That's another question, and that's part of the fun of using a first-person narrator. As the author, you have the opportunity to know more than the narrator, in this case, himself does. It was the betting about Gracie the barmaid that got my mother so mad. The men had been drinking all afternoon, playing cards. My father was unshaven and his kitchen clothes rowdy as the rest. My mother hated him when he was like that, looking like a dishwasher, she said. When he was in that condition, she never knew what to expect. He could be vile, or he might cower before her like an overgrown child, ashamed of himself and apologetic. Go and change yourself, she'd say. Then he would return, looking like a first-class barista, having shed his greasy apron and found his self-respect, having donned an outfit from his days on the cruise ships of the Italian line. Gracie came in at about 4.30 to open. Her black hair was teased a bit and sprayed into place, arranged specially in a new style so that a carefully groomed tress hung along each powdered cheek and framed her heart-shaped face. A hoop of gold glittered in each earlobe. Her lips were red, her luminous eyes rayed with black mascara. To say she was dolled up doesn't do her justice. For the Italian-American ways of young women looking for marriage in the 1960s, the ways of a certain class of dark-haired, hard-working, practical, and seductive beauty bred in Astoria or Bensonhurst or Greenwich Village, una bella donna, well-versed in the conventions of romance. The ways of a young woman such as Gracie Laporta can seem to ignorant people cheap if you say that the girl is dolled up. Gracie was beautiful. She wore a black waitress uniform piped in white that clung to her curves in the neon half-light behind the bar. The hemline had been shortened to show off her long legs and their black stockings. I was certain she was wearing a garter belt, and indeed when she bent over the, uh, and the uh, satiny material of her skirt grew taut around her hips, I could see its snaky lines under her skirt. Brand new black and white heel pumps completed the outfit. That day I was practically frightened of her beauty that lit up the place like a bolt from beyond, like a legendary ball of lightning that flashed through the village of Stovera once upon a time. I had always had a way of warming up to the waitresses and barmaids and chambermaids and salad girls who worked for us, and although she was a fairly recent arrival, Gracie and I were coming paths. When I was small, the girls, as my mother always referred to them, could see how often I'd be left alone in the busy evening hours, and it was common for them to keep an eye on me. But I wasn't a little kid in Gracie's time, and I knew a bella donna when I saw them. I'd been daydreaming at my post in the cocktail lounge, doodling aimlessly on the pages of sketchbook, just hanging around in the shadow box while the men played their game. But now, since I could not look at her, I started to draw in earnest. My pencil point, as if it had a mind of its own, followed her every silken movement. Gracie had a head on her shoulders, everybody said so, and she could be all business, which was why my mother liked her so much. That day, Gracie must have known that Georgie was there, must have seen his car out front when she arrived. They were going together, and since it was obvious to me as it was to my mother that Gracie had a brain, I couldn't believe that she'd fallen for George McGinnis, no matter how much he looked like Paul Newman, as my father liked to say. Without seeming to notice him or anybody else in particular, in her sexy heels, she had crossed through the restaurant's main foyer and tapped over to the bar room behind the table where they were playing rummy. I watched her change into a pair of flats, loved seeing the bend of each leg and the way her skirt rode up to her stockings garter snaps. Then she wrapped a neat white apron tight about her hips. A 
I felt like a thief, spilling my eyes from where I sat in the shadows. Now she flipped on the lights, dimmed them a little, and plugged a quarter into the jukebox. Moon River came on, the instrumental version. Suddenly, one of the men's voices climbed above the rest and with faint politeness said he wondered what color bra Gracie was wearing. <laughs> Rude laughter broke out. George said something, and they went on about this as if they really thought she would show them. She ignored them all, set out a tray of glasses, checked the refrigerator for lemons, put some yellow slices into a crystal bowl, counted ashtrays. Humming along with the music, she polished the bar. Georgie says black. He, he, he's gonna bet a fever on it. Can we see? A loud voice tittering stupidly. Danny Resnick? Or that other guy from Highland, the fat one who wore cowboy shirts with pearl buttons? But the loudest laughter was unmistakably George's. He sounded like a donkey bray, and from then on, that's what he was to me, Georgie the mule. Meanwhile, I burrowed into my drawing with a fever all my own. Although I was aware of something like a storm gathering nearby, I felt as if I could hold Gracie, not too tight, not too loose, with the power of my pencil. I sketched furiously, hoping she wouldn't notice me in this act of adoration. Now I realized that she must have known what she was doing that day. She wanted Georgie to be jealous of all the other eyes on her. Oh, are you guys going to play this game or that game? Leave a poor girl alone so she can work, okay? My father. And then, suddenly, my mother's voice. Zizi, Maki Christophai. A storm cloud visiting Blaine like hailstones and fire on my dad's head. You don't see the girl is ready to open? Jesus H. Christ. Game's over, fellas. You want some cu customer walk in here? Tell the cops? Shut us down? My mother's footsteps on the hardwood floor of the bar room. My mother growling as she passed behind the men. Then, everything all right, Gracie? No reply but a nod of her head as Gracie bent to the sink to wash glasses. Guido, what the hell are you doing in here? It's five o'clock. I'd expected that. And I looked up at her, sighing audibly, as I had taken to doing in those days. I closed the sketch pad without saying a word to anybody. The place was silent, the music gone. The men having quickly collected their things and made apologies as my father shooed them out a side door, he himself went without another word and slunk away into the kitchen. I slid from the booth and snuck another longing look at Gracie. She knew that I had been drawing her, and I had seen that she was interested. In truth, we were only a few years apart in age, though at the time this was a huge barrier. She was free to work behind the bar, and after five, I was banned from being anywhere near it. She smiled at me. To my mother, she said, He's making my picture, Anna. I should come in early sometime so he can finish it. Right, Guido? Your son's an artist, Anna. Eh? What's that? My mother was riffling through some papers near the cash register, squinting fiercely because she'd forgotten her reading lenses, or else because of the stack of receipts and bills, or because of my father and his greasy apron bent on chasing Lady Luck with his pals, or else because... She paused in the midst of her work with her right thumb raised to her lips. It was an automatic gesture acquired years ago when a sewing machine at the bleachery in Wappingers had pierced it leaving its nail forever deformed. Looking up from her account, she realized Gracie had said something about me. She saw that I was still nearby, and I expected another reprimand, a parting shot, before she left for the kitchen. In those busy, desperate days, I didn't believe my parents took much notice of me. I had relatively few chores and quite a few privileges around the place, as well as the envy of friends who thought that because we owned a resort, my family must be rich. My most important responsibility was to assist my ailing grandmother, to whom I was devoted. I was an honor student in high school. I was a devout Catholic who confessed himself weakly and never missed Mass. 
but I was also growing secretive and evasive. What I could hardly admit to myself was that I wished I were still the center of my mother's attention, and I suffered on account of this particular contradiction. I wished we could go back to the way it had been when my father was working in New York City, back when my grandparents were both healthy, and when on special nights my mother and I would have dinner out and take long, aimless drives on country roads. And there's a break, and then the scene resumes. I would not grow up to inherit my parents' restaurant business. They as much, uh, they as much as told me how unhappy it would make me. And what if I failed as an artist? Grown up independence I imagined as a condition beyond doubt where the will of such a one as Benvenuto Cellini could accomplish marvelous things and I yearned for them. The Villa Giustovera had been a childhood adventure land of forests and fields and happy summers when the hotel was filled with uncles and aunts and cousins and family friends. But now that my grandfather was sick, my grandmother also ill, and my parents financially strapped, it saddened me. I wanted to help them, but at the same time, I wanted to break away. After the game, after the men were gone, after everyone had been scalded by my mother's flashing temper, I loitered, loitered rebelliously in the lounge. My mother was done at the cash register. Now, with a wad of papers in her hand, she headed through the dining room for the kitchen to begin cooking for the night ahead. She was the complete restaurateur, adjusting tablecloths. This is close to home inspecting place settings as she passed, glancing at a piece of paper in her hand while probably doing a mental calculation, looking up to pull open a dining room curtain for two more inches of light. Your son's an artist, Gracie had said. I know, my mother replied, softening the furrow between her brows and suddenly stopping mid-stride to rest her hazel eyes on me. Felt as if she were seeing me for the first time in a very long while, perhaps from a new distance where she saw me more clearly. Guido, she said gently, make her a beautiful picture. So that's how chapter one ends, and indeed later on there will be the occasion when uh, Guido does Gracie's portrait. So I'll read a couple more sections and sort of jump through the story. It covers a lot of ground, you know. It really, it is a family saga, as they call a certain genre, because there's a lot about my grandparents and, uh, see, my grandparents. Guido's <laughs> Guido's <laughs> Uh, and what it was like uh, when Guido's grandparents first came to the Mid-Hudson Valley and opened uh, a resort uh, where the farm had been 